So today is the day. So hopefully he's joining. Um, so today, guys, we'll be talking to Jonathan Stoder. I don't know how to, if I'm saying the, the, the right correctly. Uh, he's going to speak to us about his new book, um, Public Secret and Private Suffering in the South African AIDS Epidemic. So he should join us today and then we're going to have this conversation with him. So just give me a few minutes while I'm waiting for him to join live okay i hope you guys um you well uh into this pandemic whatever is going on right now sorry my dog you know uh, i know there's a lot thing somewhere in Gauteng and kzn uh in cape town there's um a lot that's going on there is um we we are in the pandemic um also yeah, we just, uh, so if you just send, send, send me a message right now, it's popping up, I'm sure he's seeing the life. And also there's a taxi strike in Cape Town, which is like people are getting shot. Um, yeah, so there's a lot. I'm just hoping you guys, wherever you are right now, you're okay. And I please you to just save a few hours and then a few minutes so that you can listen we can really understand because there's just like this good chapter that I read in this book, which were like really touching. So hopefully Jonathan he will join us now, and then we'll be able to speak to him about it. And to those who are joining, Privy, uh, thank you so much. So we are waiting for Jonathan to join the live, and then he, so that he can ask me to to accept him. Okay. So, so far, while you are waiting for Jonathan, just comment, uh, where are you and how this whole pandemic and the looting and the strike have been treating you and how, how I mean, your, your thought. I mean, this open, this is, this is a safe space. <clears throat> what are your thoughts? And if you have any question about HIV and AIDS in Africa or in general, you need to stay tuned because Jonathan is going to, prof, Professor, Jonathan is going to come and explain everything and tell us what's going on and tell us about his new book. I'm just looking for him so that I can, he's not. So Jonathan, if you are actually watching right now, you need to kind of click on the video so that he can give you a better view. And then, yeah, we'll be seeing Thomas Simango. Thank you so much that you've been fine. Stay tuned. We're having some good information coming up. Right. Just wait for Jonathan. So Jonathan, if you're watching, Professor Jonathan, if you're watching, please um, try to request me to accept you so the conversation could begin. Thank you so much. I just see him. He sent me a message. But the thing is, I cannot check the message. Because if I check the message, it means I have to deal with this life. Um, just thank you so much for watching. We're waiting for Professor Jonathan to join us so that we can have this live conversation. Please, guys, please, guys, stay, 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 stay. Thank you so much, Anele. Thank you so much. I hope you are staying, though. I mean, I know weather is bad. <laughs> Network might also be, but please try. I mean, try to go and come back. Try to come back. See, Mia. Oh my God! Somebody with my name. Thank you so much. I'm also looking forward to the, 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 to this talk. I really love the. Did you did you read the, the book? So I only have like a draft copy. So this is the draft that I have, and I read. So, oh, um, okay. I'm saying Jonathan is making. Okay, please stay. Please stay. And make sure, please, can anyone who's close to Jonathan ask him to come to this page? There's my, uh, the time that he's going to VS you guys, because you guys, I can add you as a guest. But I, I want the, the you know, Jonathan to come. So if somebody could tell Jonathan to also, the way you are viewing it, he view the same thing, so that I can add him there. Because on the video, I already tag him. So he should be getting something right now. Um, okay, so the, this chapter that I, I actually read... Um, it's very sad. It's very sad. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's good. I don't know. It's um, I don't know if you guys. I think it's one of the second chapter where it says two funerals and a party. Yeah, it's kind of. It's I mean, for me, it kind of 
like, 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 it reminds me where I'm from right? because me originally I'm a Zimbabwean, and everything that's happening here and how people treat each other when they they hear that you're HIV positive, and how we used to you know like hunger and how we used to to travel like 20 kilometers to to you know to get access to medicine. Even if you want to get there, you might happen that there's a long queue. You won't be able to save that day, and you have to go back out with somebody who's really sick. I had this so many accident with my mother where she was really sick so we have to put her on a wheelbarrow and to push the wheelbarrow like um four kilometers to the hospital just imagine you are in in, in a wheelbarrow and then it's a dusty road jonathan he's here hey um let me try to add you please try to request because here i can see joseph and i cannot see you uh let me try, uh yeah, I'm seeing you, but I can, how can I aid you? Try to find some Barbaran or oh, like under your phone where you can say request because there's um there's a filter and there's a camera rotation and there's a flight light emoji and there's one, there's a, pers a person, sorry, person and something that look like a book. So press that before you go to the one that is a comment. So from your right hand of your phone, there's the there's a finish button and there's um a comment that second try to press that one try to find it please try to find it please try to find it please try to find it if i can also invite you if i can here or if you are near somebody who's also on a cell phone try to ask if they can join through their phone or if you um i think it's just fontaine Sorry, sorry, um, my English and my African is bad. So, yeah. So, as I was saying, trying to wait for Joshua. So, we, you, I mean, try to imagine, like, somebody who have, like, in Zimbabwe is very famous with my, my malaria. So, malaria normally happen when we're about to harvest, you know. Uh, so, it's basically, like, around, like, around March, April, like, from February, so like my malaria is like every way people get sick with malaria. So you need to put somebody. So you know all the people like their immune system is very weak. So they get it like more often. So you trying to push somebody on a wheelbarrow for five k uh, kilometer to to get a medicine. And when you get the clinic, the clinic is full. And the point that they also you need to wake up very early. And when somebody who's really sick, you cannot wake up that early to push somebody uh, on a wheelbarrow. So it's kind of hectic. To actually push uh, somebody like that, so you you end up like you even go there. Sometimes the clinic is full or they are very expensive. The money that they need, and you push that person again back home, you know. And you know that's why people say, "Oh, that one is HIV positive." And I mean, I think even now it's still there. The kind of stigma of saying somebody about the status, but the most thing that I'm seeing right now is that I don't think it's. It's the problem with somebody hiding it. It's about what people are saying after I told you my status. It's what you say. Every sick that I'm going to have after that, you are going to automatically think it's HIV. I'm dying. Even if it's just a headache, I'm okay. He's dying from HIV. So, yeah. So, Jonathan, he should come here and make us change our mind. I think we should change that understanding. Um, Now there's a Victor. Okay, 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 okay. I hear you. I didn't know that you, you, you speak Shona though. I really want if somebody could help J J Jonathan, guys. Like, this is hectic. Uh... Why can't this device doesn't have a way I can press and ask somebody to join? Um... Is there anyone who is near Jonathan? I'm on my piece. Oh, yeah, hectic. Can you, Jonathan, please try to use your cell phone. I think the problem is that, yes, you're on a PC. So please try to use your cell phone, your, 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 your device. Please. Try to use your cell phone. Because, oh, okay, now you're sending me a request. The one I sent to you approve. Try to request, uh... Yeah, 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 me, I did. I did send him a request. He's here now. 
I sent him a request. I think we are having Mr. Um, he's sending me requests. I'm sending me requests. So there's a request situation going over, and but it seems like he's here now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh <laughs> Sorry, I I I I'm, I was a little bit confused about how to join, but obviously I've worked it out now. It's nice to see you, Mia. Yeah. How oh you doing? Oh my gosh, nice to see you too. You know what? I wish I had <laughs> doubt that. Oh my God, is he joining? Is he not joining? Even before now, I was like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I want this to work out because I have so many questions. So we need to talk about it. Yeah, and I, I hear you. I, I heard your story as well. And uh, you were saying you were reacting to the, to the uh, funerals and parties. Uh, a yeah. little so in my introduction to the book yeah. Mm, mm. yeah so 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 first of all i just want you to tell us a little bit ab about yourself and please <laughs> don't bore us just to tell us the fascinating things only <laughs> <laughs> well I, you know i don't know i mean you know how long do you have I, you know i can sit here Hands i'm saying about myself. keep it shut <laughs> yeah no um you know i'm i'm an anthropologist who spent a lot of my life working in a place called Bushbuck Ridge, which you might know about. It's in Limpopo uh, province, far north of mm -hmm. here. In fact, I sort of started hanging around there in the 1990s um, as, a, as a master's student and then went back again um, in the early 2000s to continue to do my PhD research. Um, and so it's like a second home for me um okay. it's, and this book is really the kind of culmination of many many years of mm -hmm. not just doing field work but kind of um hanging out in in bush buck ridge um having lots of friends and uh knowing a lot of people there um so it is kind of quite a it's quite an intimate and quite a sort of almost sort of biographical kind of sketch of you know, there's a lot of me in the book. I hope um, that comes mm -hmm. through. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So you 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 mentioned it becomes your second home. So where is your first home? Uh, Johannesburg. Um, I live okay. here in uh, um, in Melville uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So first, first of all, before we go to the to the book, I I have I have picked up that in a book. There was a summer sentence you are trying to accommodating Americans. I'm not like to the, especially when it comes to the figure of amount, you'll be saying, okay, five rand is close to five dollars. So why was that? Um, because when Americans or Europeans or people who don't know rands read the book, mm -hmm. um, I want them to be able to sort of be able to understand what that amount is in their own currency. So okay. the, when I wrote the book, the editors advised do it in um, USDs, so that okay. uh, that's like kind of like a, almost like a universal currency that people understand. Yeah, that's the only reason for it. Yeah, it's okay. not not specifically for the Americans. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I know. I understand it's specific for Americans. Just learn the book. Okay, so let's dig deeper to the public secret and the private suffering in the South African AIDS epidemic. What was that all about? Everything. Tell us more. Well, I mean, it sort of starts in the early 2000s when I arrived there as a PhD student. And in fact, I never was going to do this research. It was going to be something completely different. And something you'll know about okay. anthropologists is that they always set out to do something and they never end up doing it. They end up doing something similar because what we do is we listen to what's going on on the ground and mm -hmm. um, we want to follow what happening to people so um, the first thing that happened when I sort of got there in the early 2000s was people started talking about the number of deaths um, and the number of sick people and would I help people to you know kind of get to the hospital or to access um, care in some way or another people were very very desperate um, and so that shifted my attention to looking at AIDS as you know the AIDS epidemic in um, concentrated largely in, in this place called Bushbuck Ridge, which is kind of mm -hmm. like sort of rural-ish kind of area, um, uh, but is the product of, you know, sort of several, well, at least uh, 30, 
50 years of um, sort of resettlements, moving people away from their kind of scattered homesteads into mm. closer settlement villages, as they call them, sort of like grid-like villages. Um, and a lot of unemployment, uh, a lot of, um, well, it's a, the local um, market is kind of very um, sort of polarized. You either have okay. quite wealthy people who are in civil service or you have people who yeah, are, yeah. you know, kind of manual labor sort of jobs. So anyway, so, you know, sort of every weekend there was a funeral um, and then even I remember one Christmas, um, there was even a funeral on Christmas Day. And people started, you know, traditionally you have your funerals on a Saturday. They started yeah, to yeah. throughout the week because people were saying we just cannot accommodate. You know, we have to go to everybody's funeral in villages and the villages nearby to us. We just can't do it. We're, we're you know, tired of the number of funerals. We just can't cope with it. Um, so and so was that, like, was so was oh sorry sorry to cut so was all the funerals HIV AIDS related or was it kind of different? No, no. I mean they weren't all AIDS related, but that's the thing is that when you have an epidemic like that, a bit like now really, mm -hmm. um, you find that you know the suspicion in everybody's mind is oh that's AIDS. You must have no, died. Yeah. And no. of course funerals we don't talk about the cause of death. We don't say you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so died of AIDS, we just say it was a long illness or it was a short illness or it was whatever. Um, so people are just supposing uh, and the gossip yeah. spread and the rumors start to spread saying, well, this person probably died of AIDS. Um, like I said, very similar to now as well. The first question is what is COVID? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, 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 mm. Yeah, go, go ahead. So that go really ahead. sparked my, my interest is in how you can have such overwhelming evidence that there's something that's killing all of us. Um, but at the same time, extreme sort of secrecy about it, mm -hmm. that no one really wants to talk openly about it. Um, and so I call that, um, I'm not the first one to call, to use the term public secrets, but um, yeah, yeah. I call it a kind of a public secret, something that everybody knows um but which is never actually publicly revealed and then the second yeah. part of the book is you know private sufferings um because um all these kinds of things that are happening to people the illnesses and the, the suspicion you know is it witchcraft is it aids what is it that's causing this that's all happening in the private sphere very much within say the domestic domain within the household the family um or you know like between neighbors and that sort of thing it's very much kept in the in the private um so that's that's kind of the hook of the book um i suppose so yeah. the, is is the, the book out yet or uh... yeah yeah it is funny story okay. <laughs> um i don't even have a copy of it yet because of the south african postal services i have my copy look at my copy I have, I'm in my up, at least. <laughs> yeah, yes, I did. So nowadays, what they do is they produce ebooks, like electronic books and hard. Uh -huh. And so they very nicely sent me a, a PDF of the book, um, which I okay. sent around. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the hard copy is going to be hard to get. <laughs> so yeah, it's because be a I while mean, before I they mean, post it to me. Yeah, because I was also thinking the other day, okay, let me just uh, read my iPad. But every, uh, like every notification that just pop in, I seem to go to the notification. So I, like, I'm, I'm very slow. So I need like a copy. And like, I remember yesterday I was coming from work and I'm just reading and I'm just reading. I'm just reading. I'm like, okay, because if it's on my cell phone or my tablet, I might see another email or something and just forget. Okay, so let's talk about um, a funeral at a party that whole chapter in like what so my question is like i want to ask was that really like a true story oh yeah oh yeah yeah i mean um this was a woman who i sort of lived down the road from where i was staying and i, oh. I knew her neighbor quite well um didn't know her as well um but she worked as a um domestic um laborer in this town called Hoodspread, which is 
you know, it's a former, well, still is actually um, the base for an army base um, and an air force base uh, town it was built around that in that, that army base. Um, and so she talks about how she lost her job uh, working for this white family um, because she, caught, she constantly kept on making mistakes um, in the house, uh, you know, sort of falling asleep at the stove and burning the ironing and things like that. So they chucked her. Um, and she used to work with her neighbor, who was also employed in a similar way. Um, and so she went off and, and sort of got tested um, because she also had this grandchild who was um, very, well. very, yeah. Uh -huh. um, I took the daughter and the grandchild to um, Tinswalo Hospital. The daughter was Juju? Yes, yeah. So, so one name, like real names or just character names? Just... No, these are, these are like you say, character names. We call them oh. pseudo, yeah, yeah. You, you, um, you call them? Pseudonyms. Pseudo. Okay, okay, okay. Like pseudo. Because, like, I mean, because yeah. now I was like, there's a part that say, did you rebuke them saying uh, that she was happy and her mother was dying because she would no longer have to bear the humiliation of seeing C.C. Mira begging for food from her neighbors. So, um, and to be bewitched, like that was, I think for me that was hectic, like your mother gets sick and all you, you, you have about is because she's getting serious and she's dying and you won't bear the humiliation and yeah. The, that, yeah. Was, that was, it's got to do with this and I encountered this a few times, this kind of extreme shame around being poor, this extreme mm -hmm. shame around poverty. Um, and how that was also associated with, with, with AIDS, how it was the same kind of shame um, that, you know, sort of was associated with AIDS. Um, you know, and there, there were a lot of people that I met like that. There was one of sort of my neighbors, across the road neighbors, mm -hmm. who um, was in a very similar predicament. Her daughter died um, of AIDS and she had no means of support her husband abandoned her many years before. It's a very similar story. Um, and she became incredibly bitter and twisted, you know, because of the, her predicament, but also very, very shy about the fact that they'd never had food. And she hated coming to my, well, the homestead where I was living um, mm -hmm. for food. She hated the fact that her kids used to come over and like kind of sit with me when I made my lunch, you know, I'd always make sure there's like a few extra plates and they'd like hang out with me. And she, she really hated that because although, you know, nobody resents you for doing this. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. there's still this kind of feeling that, you know, people are going to start talking about me in a particular way. And in this respect, gossip is very, very powerful. Um, yeah, 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 it does destroy not, person. Yeah, as a weapon against people. Yeah. So, and often led to insinuations of witchcraft. Um, and indeed, this woman who lived across the road from us, um, she was eventually kind of, there were, there were stories circulating that she was, she had been found naked actually in somebody's homestead in the morning. Okay. Um, in the early morning, you know, in the early morning in the rural areas. Yeah. It's really early. Well, it's like five yeah. o'clock, you know. And people go out to start sweeping the, the yard. Um, and there she was standing frozen, frozen still, according to this account. Um, okay. He had been caught by the medicine, the magical medicine that the family oh, had the traditional asked. traditional healer. Yeah. So. Um, did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that, kind of, that kind of thing um, was also happening. So. The, the tale is really one in which I weave together sort of, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of debate um, mm -hmm. and it sort of sometimes there's still about, you know, is it AIDS? Is it witchcraft? Do people believe it's witchcraft? Do they believe it's AIDS? And my kind of position on this, which I, I kind of get from what people are telling me, is that this is constantly shifting. You can yeah. have you know, some people who privately will say, well, it's witchcraft, or they'll say it's AIDS, mm -hmm. or, you know, they'll say both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, people you know, these, these things so, kind of interweave with each other. Yeah. 
so I, I just want to ask, like, so I, I, I know that you did a research for quite a long, long, long time, but mm. if I, and I will ask you in short, what do you think would be the best way to educate and to let people separate witchcraft and HIV in short? With something that you have learned during your research and were you mm. writing this book? Yeah, I mean, I think people do separate HIV and witchcraft. Um, mm. I mean, I think what the stories that I was hearing is that there isn't this direct relationship between AIDS and witchcraft. Um, people were saying, you know, witches can't send AIDS. AIDS is more powerful than witches. Um, yeah. And they were saying witches can take advantage of somebody who has AIDS because they can hide behind. Yeah, exactly. that, I, mean, yeah. I mean, because that's say when because that's one of the things what they do in the village is that if you say so, why are you not telling people to go to to clinic? Say if you go to clinic and they see you, they will start talking about it, and then that's the only way which is can also come with saying that yeah, you're already sick. So I rather keep myself safe, not going anyway. And exactly. then they have this medicine that they think, okay, if I take this or if I steam myself three times a week. If I drink this, to keep my my immune system strong, which is which is not true. I don't, I don't know if some are true. So I, I, I mean, I don't want to be like it's not true or what because I mm. I never be there. So I think that's where you you come in with your research or what you've seen. So do you think the whole steaming traditional? Do you think it helps sometimes? I'm really not sure um, uh -huh. because I don't really have the capacity to sort of like test these things out i think steaming you know sort of generally you know i've done steaming before and it's really helped my my nasal congestion <laughs> um i've i've and i've called okay. you know sort of inhale the herbs and i've always sort of thought well it seems to have quite a good effect it's quite a pleasing calming effect actually it had on me um so but i in terms of treating aids I think that antiretrovirals are probably more efficient. In fact, they definitely are a more efficient way and kind of um, long term in, in, in treating HIV. Um, they're not a cure, though, so no one can really claim to have a, a cure for AIDS. Um, so so yeah. now when, when somebody reading your book, what is that one thing you just wish people could take from this book? and some another thing that you think people should just read but never take it serious <laughs> it's quite a cool question um the thing that i mean part of like the reason why i wrote the book was i was sitting in 2018 or whenever it was yeah 2017 2018 and reading a lot of public health literature not anthropology mm -hmm public health literature, which, and I come from my previous organization was part of this whole sort of HIV treatment sort of industry. And I worried that by saying that we are going to solve AIDS by 2025 or 2023, or, you know, the date, mm -hmm. the date from shifting, but you know, this thing about how you and AIDS is basically going to conquer HIV AIDS and it's not going to be an epidemic anymore by a particular date. And it's going to be through this treatment program that they're going to achieve this. I just see that, saw that as being highly problematic. And I started thinking about my research and I actually went back to Bushbuck Ridge as well in 2018 mm -hmm. to go and talk to people about, you know, sort of what do you think is happening now? Is this after AIDS? Is this now, we're entering into an era after AIDS. And people say, yeah, I mean, you know, we don't have AIDS anymore. What we've got now is ARVs. And I thought that was kind mm -hmm. of interesting, that you no longer have this AIDS epidemic, and this is in the book, by the way, but you have this epidemic of ARVs. Um, and so AIDS remains, but it's just kind of like cloaked in secrecy again, or kept out of sort of sight or invisibilized is the word that I use by this, you know, program mm -hmm. of providing people pharmaceuticals, um, okay. which 
combat the disease. So that's, that's really where I was coming from. And the second thing was, I really think that it's important that we don't ignore memory. That we don't just sort of say, pre, you know, 2005, there was no antiretrovirals. Now, post-2005, there's antiretrovirals. Therefore, this is a completely new era. And what that yeah. does is actually denies the memories of those people who have died, who suffered um, terribly, and the people around them who still are suffering from those memories and still grieving the dead. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if my colleagues on here, but he would appreciate me saying that it's very hard to keep the dead down, you know, even though they covered in you know, down. heat, they down. They, they, down. they arise, right? And mm -hmm. through memory they are reanimated. So that's the thing. And then I suppose, how, I don't know, <laughs> I just want people to read. I hope that people can sort of go from the more theoretical sections to the more ethnographic, you know, sort of sections of the book and enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I hope that they kind of, I, I hope that, it's, I mean, not just enjoyable as in how oh, this is a great read, but, you know, somebody yeah. was recently that, and in fact, the one editor of the series that I published this book under was saying, you know, he shed a few tears when he read about you know, a couple of the characters and you were saying it's some of it's yeah. very, and I think, I think, yeah, yeah, it is. It is a sad story, you know. I mean, not, it's, it's, it's I, 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 I think it, it is sad story. I mean, there's, there's no way we could say, oh my God, great story. Oh my God, good work. I mean, you are speaking about HIV, you're talking about HIV, somebody that we, we, we pray one day gonna you know, wake up tomorrow is gone. But however, the way everything just put it together, how this book comes together, is kind of take you back to reality, but still keep you back like, hey, this is not your life, wake up, keep reading, you know? But it's, it's, it's kind of book that say, keep re re reading and learn more, keep reading and learn more. There's a chapter that I, I did not read, that I think you can explain a little bit. There's a chapter you talk about um, TB, uh, tuberculosis. So I didn't read up a little about that. I didn't wasn't it there yet. So do you wanna do you wanna go into it? Uh, sorry, which chapter is that? I think there's a chapter about TB something. I think I saw it somewhere. Uh, I didn't really go into it. All yeah. right. This, this is you know this is where you need to come with your home homework done. <laughs> um, if your homework is not done, this is where we are now. <laughs> let me just let me just see what's going on here. I mean, you know, one of the points mm -hmm. is that um, that I guess I'm, 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 I make quite a lot is that you know people don't just suffer from HIV. There's also mm -hmm. you know it seems to be the main affliction, um, but. Um, I hear you. Um, you know, there's there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of mention of that um, mm -hmm. in the book um, because they are these kind of like parallel epidemics, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. and TB is ultimately what kills people with AIDS. Um, but let me let me let me ask you something, or see if we can. Mm -hmm chat about this um the the why when i was writing this i well i mean i started writing it in you know sort of 2018 and it took quite a long time but when i really started getting into it was in 2020 and as i started writing suddenly COVID, um and that was kind of almost like um a reflection point for me where I could actually think about COVID and think about AIDS at the same time and think about these, not just as co-occurring epidemics, but as epidemics that have very similar features. And in the conclusion to the book, I kind of do explore sort of what the parallels are between the two epidemics, um, how the social response and the public health response has been, you know, and so there are quite stark differences between how we responded to AIDS and how we respond, responding now to COVID. I mean, a kind of fairly dramatic 
sort of you know lockdowns and sort of yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. national global kind of epidemic um, is is quite different to the way in which we didn't in some cases respond to AIDS quickly enough or um, sort of you know with with much certainty as we have done with with COVID. So that's a difference. But the thing is, what I do identify, um, and I'd really like to hear your opinion about this, is this kind of the way in which perhaps we think about epidemics and how we creatively kind of engage with them, sort of make up stories about them and actually base a lot of our, our actions on those stories. So the one thing that struck me was how race and ideas about culture um, and uh, particularly in South Africa, but also sort of in other in other countries as well. African countries, and well in the U.S. as well. How mm -hmm. this has been during the argument is, is that during the AIDS epidemic, um, a lot of blame was allocated towards African cultural practices. Um, so sort of traditions like mm -hmm. which. But also like things like um, circumcision or not being circumcised or traditional healing um, and traditional healers in general um, and the kind of knowledge and practices that they have um, were sort of seen as being counterproductive to the fight against AIDS. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, sort of that's, a, you know, sort of I write about that and with respect to the COVID epidemic, I was kind of looking for that as well to see okay. has that come out. And the interesting thing about COVID is it started off actually as a white person's disease because the mm -hmm. very first people who were infected in South Africa, at least, were whites. Uh, wealthy uh, because he, he was traveling though. Well, he was yeah. the, I, I don't know, I, like, I haven't come across somebody saying, COVID come with white people, and if I see that 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 that, that person, I'm like, wow, because I don't have power to punch people. But yeah. if I was Ramaphosa, I was gonna punch <laughs> you because I think it's just somebody who traveled. I don't think it's a white thing. So coming to ask black people, like you asked about circumcision, I don't know. I mean, I I grew up in a small village in Zimbabwe called Tibinge. Mm. Um, as growing up with HIV, most of people are like HIV is for white people. Because why 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 do white people allows their kids to have sexual intercourse before marriage, mm. and 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 they allow their kids to to having sex before they they are where well, they're still young and they're still exploring. So yeah. for, for for them it was like yeah you need to be a Christian you need to be there's no sex before marriage. But then as I grow I realized there is sex before my marriage and i was i mean I, I i grew up gay and i'm gay and i've seen people are like people are really having sex right left right center uh, before <laughs> my marriage and the people who are also get yeah. married with their virgin and they, they started having sex and marriage they are also hiv positive you know mm. so it, like even now i see people like no what like for me I'm on prep, but somebody say, "Why are you taking prep? Because you are engaged. You you do want to cheat." I'm like, I, I I don't know. I meant cheat, but the one thing I want to know, I want to make sure if I cheat, I don't can, can come home with HIV or an STI. So I use prep and I use condom. Mm -hmm. So and also keep in mind that people who are married, they they got HIV. They were, they were infected with HIV. So there's no one who's clever. There's no one who knows anything about HIV. So. You might say, okay, I'm cool, I'm, I'm keeping myself, but one day you might end up sleeping with your ex. And, you know, we all know the trauma about ex. You, nobody ever used protection when you're sleeping with your ex. And that is a lie. But today on this show, we are talking about the book, so we're moving on. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about circumcision. In Zimbabwe, circumcision, I don't think it's a thing. There is no culture that says, I mean, there is, um, uh, what, 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 what is this language again? Um, the one Penny Penny use, I don't know what language is that, I forgot it, Changana, Changana oh. are the one who do the whole circumcise, are you, are you, and women, when they go check if they're still a virgin, but even these days, girls go there, and if they find they're not a virgin, they just give you money under the carpet, and they just keep quietly say, she's a virgin, and <laughs> boys, I mean, 
I go circumcise when like three years back when I'm in relationship that I my because like mm -mm, babe that skin has to go. So that's why I I I I, I was like okay babe the skin is going and I just went to the, to, to, to the doctor and the skin was gone. Yeah. So to answer your your, your question, it wasn't because of culture or circumcision. We grew up saying HIV come from white people, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know about um, COVID. Well, I mean, the, I guess the point that I was making is, I mean, you've kind of really answered it, um, mm. is that there's this, in the public health realm, in the public world of public health, in their writings, um, and often in the popular media as well, uh, yeah. you know, AIDS is blamed on certain kind of traditional practices. Yeah. Uh, and I was kind of interested in seeing if, you know, how, how does this kind of manifest itself in the COVID yeah. epidemic? Like, is that kind of surfacing? And what I picked up on, but it's sort of not very, not, not very prominent, but what I did pick up on is firstly the ban against smoking and drinking. Mm -hmm. That I felt that this was aimed not at <clears throat> middle class, say kind of whites or middle class blacks, but it was aimed largely at the poor who had to share a bottle of beer or had to share its all. <laughs> so hence, hence, <laughs> hence a famous song, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other thing was that, you know, a number of videos circulated in social media, um, which showed uh, white, sort of middle class white woman instructing black people on how to wash their hands correctly. And not just mm -hmm. saying, you know, sing happy birthday but it was kind of like getting them all in a group and instructing them on how to wash hands which mm -hmm. i thought was like blatantly kind of saying something about black bodies and saying no but that, however you know I, these black I, bodies i, 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 I need us to, to to fix this though let's fix it for a few minutes i remember one month back some we were asked we were sent an email to do a short video about COVID. we get a script and uh, like everybody, I, I, I won't even ask, I won't tell you the place where it happened because yeah, I might get fired. So everybody decided not to do it, the video. Because they say, if you do it, they tell us to come with the COVID, so I won't do it. So I did the video and then they're like, oh, so you did the, the video. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, why? I'm like, because it's saving lives. And like, no, because they need to do it. So this is a thing. Black people, they don't want to do any something. But if one person do it, it's still the problem that why what why, why, why person is doing it because we are the dirty one. When we say black person do it, then they're like, oh, I'm doing it because you are you, you, you're using me. So I've, COVID they have teach me that people always blame somebody. It could be white, it could be Canada, it could be anyone, it could be Indian. We were always looking for a place to to literally blame or something. Now COVID has come to the point where by rich poor you need to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Wear a mask. When you are walking to a mall, please sanitize. But you will see somebody walking in a mall, and, and when the security guy, you say, can, you, can I sanitize you? They turn, some, they, become, they become moody or have an attitude. What's going on? Everybody's sanitizing. And the sanitizer that you're using, there's also a billionaire white man who passed you, and they sanitize the same sanitizer. So if you're thinking being rich is, is, is contagious, just use the sanitizer so you can also be rich. And if you think being poor is contagious, also use the sanitizer so the white person will come and use it so they can be poor. So we get opportunity for us <laughs> to work together. I feel like COVID is a test. We need to work together. We need to put masks. We need to sanitize. We need to social distance everyone. Because even on a bank, there is social mm. distance. Mm. You need to two meters, and the bank is serious. It's two meters. I went to to to, to, to Abza. It's two meters. You there? One person is there. So oh, yeah. this is not black thing. This is not white thing. This is a thing for everybody. White people are getting infected with COVID. Black people are getting infected with COVID. Age or young. I there was this child who's like nine months right now old. They just tested positive. Mm. It crash, and the mothers asked to hurry up home the child is not okay. So we need to kind of wake up. This is nothing to do with lottering. This is, yeah, that's another subject. Okay, 
let's go back to the book okay okay so where can people get this book um it's available online through uh -huh. springer uh which okay. is the publisher yeah um and it should also be in good book stores sometime okay. soon not sure when um if there's anybody who and this is like not official I'm, I'm not saying this really but you know if anybody wants it if they want a copy i could always ask you and you could email you? them that i <laughs> yeah because you know i mean we don't make any money out of these <laughs> out of these books as well, academic uh -huh. so i'm i'm you know if there's somebody who's really that fascinated to read it yeah i'd love that um no I'd i'm reading it i'm reading so where, where where people using condom like i was there a story of people using condom will be given free condom at the clinic so yeah I mean, condoms condoms were available and there were so many different kinds of ngos and cbos in fact i founded and and worked for a kind of community-based organization uh mm -hmm. you know public service i didn't you know it wasn't a job um in the area and you know they did tons of condom distribution um especially in those early years and then shifted along to doing kind of like care and support work um but you know condoms weren't used 100 yeah. percent of the time and sometimes only with a woman that you've just met yeah but Where, then with the one that you down the line yeah, but the, then you have three others who are you having kind of casual sort of affairs with what do they say you you know the macro pennies or the yeah, uh, armpit roll-on <laughs> lovers um so or or, or nazis you know the, uh -huh. the yeah the mistresses so i i drew a little map i didn't include this in the book but i once drew a little map and i mapped out according to about 30 people's sort of sexual histories, um, biographies, I worked out like how many sexual partners they had um, and have had, so their histories as well as current. And okay. what I worked out, sort of it formed like a network of people and you could see how far and how inclusive this network was. So in other words, it, it ranged from sort of the high school principal rat down to say you know a schoolgirl so the people who are involved in this network vast number of people um and very un, you know sort of quite highly differentiated so you'd have yeah like professional principal of a school down to sort of you know, just an unemployed schoolgirl and also across geography so across space so you know from people living in durban mozambique cape town etc these net this network kind of spread across the country so you know if you've got hiv sort of getting into into that network um its capacity to you know sort of infect a large number mm -hmm. of it's just incredibly efficient and if you think about it, it's a bit like COVID. you know you go you go to the shops somebody coughs on you 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 know your mask yeah. is on well, you don't sanitize you come back home you know you give it to your wife your wife goes off to work tomorrow you know and then she shakes somebody's hand or something by mistake <laughs> just explodes and it can you know so perhaps not as you know fortunately hiv required you to actually share you know bodily fluids blood um and and usually you know sort of vaginal and 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, and semen mm -hmm. Um, in order to actually acquire it. So it's quite difficult to get it, but, yeah. um, you know, not as efficient as, as COVID. Thank God for that. Um, but I sometimes wonder, you know, if it, if it spread as rapidly and as fast and as efficiently as COVID, do you think we might have a vaccine at this point for, for AIDS? Um, you know, yeah. so that's, that's a question that's been on a lot of people's minds. Do you think they wanna they wanna make a vaccine for HIV? Do you think they wanna make a vaccine? Well, we've been trying. Um, you know, Glenda Gray yeah. and has been trying for uh, a number of years. There's been several trials that have shown sort of 
a vague promise, but you know, as you know, you know, you've got to, there has to be a certain amount of efficacy behind that vaccine. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think, I mean, I just, I, one of, one of my more cynical kind of moments is I feel like sometimes when it really matters, we can actually pull together and develop vaccines. Look how quickly we develop these COVID vaccines. Now that might be because we've been working on, you know, similar kinds of diseases for a long, long time. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, the coronaviruses have been around for ages. We've been trying to develop vaccines for them anyway. But um, one of the sort of things that makes me sort of doubt the commitment is that when we had this latest wave, I'm mean, talking like the early 2000s of Ebola, mm -hmm. uh, West Africa, um, before it hit the shores of Europe and the US, there was very little movement on the vaccine front for Ebola. And what was discovered is that the CDC had actually developed a candidate vaccine for Ebola, but it had been shelved many, many years previously because there basically was not seen to be a big need to develop the vaccine any further, to take it to oh, some yeah. phase three trials and et cetera, because, oh, well, it wasn't really a big problem. And then suddenly, yeah. realized, oh, hell, maybe we should have actually developed that vaccine. They're now on the way of actually developing a proper vaccine for Ebola, for, but huh? it, for, it kind of... Ebola? It, it, uh, do we Ebola, still have yeah. Ebola around? Do, do we still get yeah. people that are getting... Uh, the last oh. outbreak was quite recent, actually. Oops, look at me being ignorant. I, 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 I do not know that Ebola is still happening. I'm just, this, this, this COVID has been kicking me busy. Okay, so before I let you go, because my head is, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm boiling. I've, there's so many information. So, um, what is your next goal right now? What is, what is next for Jonah, for Professor Jonathan? What, what's, what, what, what's next? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I need to take a break, but um, one of the projects that I, had started and then some things happened there was delays and then COVID was mm -hmm. looking at um a, a sort of a lung clinic a specialist lung clinic and um, that deals okay. with lung disease and okay. um looking at how what kind of innovations um they have brought technological innovations mm -hmm. they have brought to alleviating a lot of the suffering that people experience with um, lung disease. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, with, with TB, severe cases of TB, sometimes I said, you know, various lung cancers. Um, one of the biggest problems is draining the lungs and having to go and sit in hospital for ages while you get your lungs drained of fluid because, you know, you can't breathe. Um, so there's a very simple little kind of thing, which is basically to stick a tube in the lung and to mm -hmm. carry around um, a sort of a plastic bag that actually absorbs all that fluid um, and drains the lung. And it means that people who are at the end of their lives, say with, with lung cancer, can actually climb onto an airplane and go and see, I mean, this is based on a story that a woman told me, one of the, one of the patients, that she can now go and see her grandchildren before she dies. You know, things like that. Um, oh, okay. So I wanted to, follow these doctors around as they did this kind of work um but it's a lung clinic it's at a hospital and at the moment those are no-go areas um, oh yeah, yeah it's it's also kind of partly spurred on by my interest in in tb i've done some work recently um about tb adherence and adherence to the drugs and it's also sort of going back to the work you know eric um we work together on an, on another book um, mm -hmm. about microbicides and uh, HIV prevention. So I'm kind of quite interested in the technology um, that is developed and used by medicine to sort of improve adherence and to try and prevent uh, and, and treat uh, various kinds of diseases. So that, that's hopefully in the future for me, but <laughs> I don't know, I can't seem to be able to think very far in the future at the moment. 
I feel like it's it's uh, perhaps not worth it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it is. It's a bit depressing. If, 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 I mean, if everything dies down, it is worth it. However, um, thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank, thank you so much for joining and sharing. So, how can people contact you? Either email, Facebook, your social media. Tell us. Uh, Facebook, uh, emails fine as well. My my, mm -hmm. the email that you have is my official email. So that's uh -huh. that's always good. People can always write to me and uh, ask and, me. And and then oh. your Facebook account is Jonathan. Uh, you Facebook. <laughs> you you forgot you forget your 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 username Jonathan and your surname. I think it's just Jonathan Stadler. Um, yeah. Really sort Stadler. of. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's. Yeah. So. I, are you on Twitter? You know, this world is is moving to Twitter slowly. Are you on Twitter? Uh, I have a Twitter thing <laughs> on my phone. Okay. <laughs> but you haven't opened it. <laughs> I kind of do sometimes, but I've I've never tweeted. Sorry, I'm a bit of I'm a bit of a luddite when it comes to this and. So okay. maybe, maybe I need to get more with it with these social media things is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really no, no, not saying anything. I'm saying we might need you in every social media so that when we need help, we just, you know, tag you like, hey, listen, this is what's going on, you know? So well, that's all. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Hey. So thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have and a great evening. It was really Good great night. as well, Mia. And uh, you keep you. well, hey? Stay safe, huh? All right, thanks. Thank you. Bye. Sanitize, mask on, be safe. Thank All you. All right. I will do, man. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, guys, that was it. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much. So, this book. Uh, so, if you need the cover of this book, send me a DM, a message. I will speak to him. I also have a copy, so I might forward it to you via email. Um, yeah, so send me a message, say you need this. Mia, thank you so much for staying. Just thank you so much for staying. I love you. Nah. Have a good night, guys. Mask up. Do not loot like other people. Mm. If you have really done that, so stop it. <laughs>